Happy Thursday, everybody, and welcome to episode 58 of the Snyder Cut. I am your host, Jeff Snyder, senior film reporter at Collider.com. And we have got a jam-packed show today. There has been a lot going on in the news and elsewhere. But before we get into the headlines, we're actually going to start this episode with some reviews. That's right. I'm moving the reviews up from the end of the show to the beginning because we've got two heavy hitters this week. And those are Netflix's awards contenders, Mank and Hillbilly Elegy. And I got to tell you, folks, if you thought this was the year for Netflix to win the Best Picture Oscar, I've got some bad news for you. It's not going to happen at all. Not even close. Netflix, just stop spending money. Just pack it in. You're not winning Best Picture this year. Wow. Uh, So let's start with Mank. That's the big movie. This was, if you guys know me, if you've seen me compete on the Schmodown, if you've just ever heard me talk in real life, you know that David Fincher is my favorite director or my second favorite director. He's easily top three. Fincher is brilliant. He is, he's a god. He's a god. He's a movie god. Unfortunately, this movie, Mank, was... Almost unwatchable. Uh, It's a huge disappointment. And I just, I read a whole bunch of reviews. I just finished it just now. I've read a whole bunch of reviews. And everybody's just tripping over themselves to like kiss this guy's ass. Like nobody wants to be seen bad-mouthing Mick. Um, The average person is going to reject this film so quickly They won't even be able to tell you whether they liked it or not because they will have not have seen it despite trying. Uh, So last night, we made a night of Mank. Me, dad, and his girlfriend. We ordered in a pizza. We settled down around 8, 8.15. Turned the lights off, got the volume up. Boom, Mank starts. They did not last an hour. 51 minutes they lasted before they said, Jeffrey, Turn this off. This isn't good. This isn't good. This isn't for us. And you know what? The worst part was I had to agree with them. I couldn't blame them. I couldn't be like, you guys are crazy. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm going upstairs to finish this. I too was like, you know what? You're right. This movie is boring. Boring as fuck. It is a wank. Mank is a wank. I finished it this morning uh, and it didn't, didn't really improve. So, like, where to begin? I mean, listen, let's just, let's just be clear here. Let's, come on. The script was written by Jack Fincher, David's father. Like, this is a passion project for him. This is not just a story that maybe David has always wanted to tell because he, you know, grew up hearing his father talk about it. But it's a, it's, it, it is bringing his father's work to the screen in a way that has never happened before. Uh, Jack Fincher, it's not like he was, you know, a big screenwriter. He was, I believe he was like a journalist. Um, So like, while I respect it on one hand that that David wants to do right by his father and, and, and make this movie. And it is, you know, an ode to old Hollywood, the golden age and all the, the studio Titans and Thalberg and Louis B. Mayer. And you know what, maybe film Twitter and film critics are going to go nuts for this. Maybe the old Academy would have gone nuts for this. The average person who sits down to watch this movie on Netflix is not going to finish. Okay, so I can't can't wait to see what the viewership numbers are that Netflix uh, touts for this one. Because I promise you, people are not going to finish this movie. It drags on. It's so slow and boring. I mean, the other big thing, and this may just be my own personal thing, I am not a drinker. I don't like to drink, never like the taste of alcohol, never like the feeling of being drunk, never like the hangover. And generally, even though I've been the designated driver among my friends for 20 years now, uh, don't like being around drunk people at all. They're really annoying. And we're going to spend the entire movie two hours and 12 minutes with Herman Mankiewicz, Gary Oldman, who's just sauce the pretty much the entire time. And that does not make fun, make for a fun movie. 
okay? Like, the, the movie's not funny. The movie, there's no great drama in it. What, like, what are the stakes of this movie? Whether Herman Mankiewicz gets a writing credit or not? Do you think it's fun, exciting, interesting to watch someone write a movie? It's not. The whole credit thing, okay? I thought this was a movie about like Orson Welles and Mank going head to head about credit for uh, Citizen Kane. Not only do you not even really see what Mankiewicz is writing. So it's a movie about writing where you never actually see the writing. You'd have to be familiar with Citizen Kane, which I haven't seen since college. So 14 years. Um, and most people will have watched Mank without having seen Citizen Kane, period. They'll have no idea what the hell is going on. Uh, but from what I could tell, and a lot of this dialogue was like flying over my head because it's just coming at you a mile a minute. Uh, the credit thing comes up with 12 minutes left in the movie and there's seven minutes of credits. So the last five minutes of the movie, Oldman is like, Hey, I, I want credit for this. And Orson Welles is like, what? Like that shouldn't that have been the movie? Not the last five minutes of the movie. The performance is, I mean, listen. It's clear that some money was spent on this thing, right? Uh, the production design is exquisite. The cinematography is gorgeous. Now, the black and white, uh, you know, photography from Eric Messerschmidt. The performances are all fine. I mean, Oldman was fine. He's too old for the role. The guy died at 55, Mankiewicz. I think Oldman's are older than that already. Uh, and that, and, and the story set like 11 years before then. So... Mank's supposed to be 44, which Gary Oldman is definitely not. Um, okay, Amanda Seyfried wasn't terrible. We're talking about Oscars for her now? We're talking about giving Amanda Seyfried an Oscar for, for that performance that I just watched? Really? Charles Dance and Arliss Howard were definitely the best two in the movie. I mean, I really did like Arliss Howard's uh, Louis B. Mayer. Um, but like I'm working on a top 10 performances in David Fincher movies piece. And I, you know, requested access to Manx so that I could see if there were any performances that, that belonged on that list. No, there's no performances going on the list of the 10 greatest performances that David Fincher has ever, ever elicited from actors. Like, wow. <laughs> I mean, like Tom Pelfrey, he was getting buzzed for this too. I love Tom Pelfrey. He was amazing in, in Ozark and he should have won the Emmy. He didn't even get a nomination. We, he's not getting a nomination for this. He, he was fine. Everybody was fine. No, nobody stood out. Nobody was great. I've seen way better performances in dozens of movies this year. I just, again, this was so slow. I mean, I, I, we talked about the reviews last week where I was like, read between the lines of these reviews. If there's admiration but there's no genuine love. Every movie, I mean, the thing has like, it's like 89% fresh and rotten tomatoes. Even the good reviews are all like, well, it left me a little cold. It's a little cold. I, you know, there was one bad review from top critics from the AD club, from Iggy. The phoniness of Mank often gets in the way as unintended clumsiness and miscasting undercuts the more deliberate and self-aware distractions. Um, he also says, where is it? In its worst stretches, it is repetitive, muddled, and even dull, sagging under the thesis of its uncredited source material. Like, this stuff is just not that interesting. Maybe it's interesting to 60 or 70 year old guys in the academy, and maybe it would have gotten some, a lot of award attention. I mean, I'm sure it's going to get flooded with nominations, but this is just not a winner. The same way the trial of the Chicago 7 is not a winner. And the same way still Billy Elegy is certain, certainly not a winner, but like, I was just kind of flabbergasted by how disappointing I found Mank. Like I knew, I had always suspected that it was gonna come to this. Like my review was not gonna be great and, and then I would be the contrarian. I didn't wanna be the contrarian. I worship Fincher. I worship this man. I would do, if he called right now and said, Jeff, I want you to crawl around and bark like a dog, I would do it. This movie is almost unforgivable. I mean, we had, it, it, how, it took so long to make this thing. This last movie was Gone Girl, wasn't it? Like, 
we've been waiting for this. Oof. Decent score from from uh, Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross. Um, but yeah, just nope, 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 all around. It's not a bad movie. I'm not saying it's a bad movie. I'm saying this is a disappointing movie uh, that I think that the average person will reject within minutes. Um, maybe he fell under Fincher's four-year deal, though, because that's the word on the street that he signed a four-year exclusive deal with Netflix that is worth uh, over, it's worth nine figures, so over $100 million. Um, and maybe that was part of it. Maybe it's like, listen, I, I, if I'm going to sign this deal, like you got to put the bill for, for Mank, which is my passion project. I've been trying to do it for years. You know, um, I just... I promise you, I promise you, the new academy with younger people and diverse people, they're not going to go for this movie, which is just full of old white, old, old white men, basically. Um, and yeah, it's not even really about who wrote Citizen Kane. It's just like about like, oh my God, I can't even. Uh, and what's funny is that most of the reviews this week were about Hillbilly Elegy and, and, and all everything I just did, that's what they were doing about Hell Billy Alex. Now, I can't believe how bad this is. It's laughably terrible. Everything, I mean, a lot of people were like, it's laughable, laughable, laughable. I was laughing. Unintentional laughter. I don't understand critics these days. The group think is amazing. Like, no one is, everyone's just terrified to step out of line and put forth an honest opinion. Here's the truth about Hillbilly Elegy. It's not, it's not a very good movie. It's not a good movie. I will grant you that. But it is, it like, it, it does have moments and it does work from time to time. I teared up or, or maybe not teared up, but like welled up with emotion three or four or five different times. And that's because they're just throwing everything at you. It's just everything in the kitchen sink. Like, I feel like at some point in this movie, the entire time someone was in the hospital, always. Like they either just died or they OD'd or like a lot of visits to the hospital in this movie. Um, so here's the other, you know, every review I read and I read a lot of reviews of Bill Billy Elegy, everyone like mentions Trump. Donald Trump's not in the movie. I understand that the book became a hit because of Trump and due to Trumpers and stuff like that. But like, we don't need to politicize movies. I know people will say inherently, this is a political movie or that all movies are inherently political. That's not how I look at movies. I don't look at them for the isms, okay? So forget Trump. Maybe this movie isn't even set in the 90s, it's set in the 60s or it doesn't fucking matter. It is set in, you know, a, a red state, although it starts out being like, you know, this movie is going to be set in Kentucky, where I felt most at home, J.D. Vance. Then he just gets bullied the entire time, uh, the entire time in Kentucky. It seems like he hates it there. And the movie's set in Ohio. Uh, the movie is poorly written, I would say, by Vanessa Taylor, who won an Oscar for Shape of Water. Um, and poorly directed by Ron Howard, uh, who just, man, like it's, I don't think it's Ron Howard's worst movie. Like, so, uh, you know, Collider reviewed Hillbilly Elegy. We gave it an F. I don't think this is an F movie. I, I think that is, um, I, I think that's, a, that's being a little too hard on it. Uh, this movie was not as bad as In the Heart of the Sea. Like, but it's clear Ron Howard has lost a step. Like, this guy is just not what he used to be. The, the problem with Hillbilly Elegy is that it was turned into this prestige Oscar bait movie by Ron Howard for Netflix, giving him God knows how much money to make this. Uh, probably too much, if we're being honest. If, if this had been like an A24 focus features movie with an indie director and an indie cast and stuff, not that the performances are really the problem here. This would have been a good movie. Um, as it stands, like, yeah, everybody's just, like, going big. I mean, Amy Adams, Glenn Close, they're both good. Um, I don't know if Amy Adams will get a nomination. Glenn Close could. 
Gabriel Basso, I thought he was okay. I get that he's a little bland. Um, he's a little, I mean, he's always reacting, JD. You know, he's always like walking into these, or at least older JD is like walking into these situations and having to clean up the mess. And, and so he's not a particularly uh, compelling character. I actually liked young JD a lot. I think his name, I don't have it in front of me, but I think it's Owen Estalos or something like that. That kid was good. Like, I thought that was a very good child performance. Um, but yeah, it's just like this movie just heaps it on one after another thing. And it becomes like this, I'm not, I'm not going to object to the phrase poverty porn. Like, that is, sort of is what it is, but it's also affecting. Like, these are human situations. Here's my problem with film criticism these days. And I think it's, I really think it's fair if you look, or, look at the people writing the, these reviews. They, none of them, not none of them, but most of them, they don't have any life experience, okay? They've experienced life through the big screen and they've never made mistakes of their own and they haven't gotten out to see the seedier parts of America or, or the more drown, downtrodden parts. They've never had a, friends who have overdosed. They've never, it's just like, I don't think most critics could relate to a movie like Hillbilly Elegy, you know, because they all went, uh, you know, to, to fucking Ivy schools. And I mean, here I am, NYU film school guy talking about it. It's not like I've, you know, ha had a, a, a difficult life. You know, I'm, I'm up, grew up upper middle class, like in the nice suburbs of Boston. Like, I get it. I'm not saying I come from the, the backwoods, uh, the hills of Kentucky, but like, you have to give this movie its due. Um, I think that it is going to resonate with a lot of people in, in middle America. Like, and, and it's like, you have, to, you have to make movies for that audience. Like, that's, there's 70 million people in this country who voted for Trump. That's still 70 million people who may subscribe to Netflix and are looking to be entertained. And they're not going to be looking to shit like me. Okay, that's for the liberal coastal elites. This is for the heart of America. And I think that, you know, I'm not, I don't want to paint everybody as, as you know, heroin addicts and, and, and stuff like that. Or, or they don't all look like Mima, you know, who, who looks like a, a caricature. But I don't know. I, I think that they're going to find a lot more in this movie to, to relate to than me. Um, and it was just so funny to see the opposite reactions, whereas Mank is hailed as this new masterpiece and Hillbilly Elegy is just thrown in the trash. Uh, I, 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 don't, I don't think, believe me, I don't think Hillbilly Elegy is a masterpiece at all. Um, it's a pretty, a pretty messy movie, but I, I was definitely um, pleasant, not pleasantly surprised, but like definitely new watching it. Like this, the critics had their knives out for it. Like that's clear as day. David Poland tweeted as much. Like the critics were ready to pan a movie. And, you know, bad, but people like reading bad reviews. And so, yeah, the knives are out for, for Ron Howard, for this movie, for J.D. Vance, you know, for some of the crazy shit that he says on, on Twitter. Um, but, like, I just don't know what people expected from that movie. You know, people were like, uh, it really focuses on the individual and, and, you know, the pulling yourself up by your bootstraps and it ignores all the, the systematic problems. Like, that's not what this story is. I, 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 it, to me, it is a, a, an inspirational story. Like, this kid was, J.D. Vance was not supposed to become who he became. He, he was supposed to be a hick, for a, a lack of a better term, or a redneck, you know, which is a term that he, he does not like, um, as said in the movie. But you know, he, he defied the odds. He made his way to Yale Law School. And then he wrote this book. I, I, again, I wish that there was like more to it than that. Um, but again, it, it's not so much about, I don't think it's so much about who he became as it is where he came from, but others might disagree. So either way, you can take both of these off the, the best picture list. Neither one of these movies is winning best picture. So Nomadland's chances, even though I haven't seen that yet, grow by the day. All right, we're going to talk about some other smaller reviews later in the show. But I, I had to like just rant and rave about uh, th those two movies because 
they're just dominating the cultural discourse right now. All right. The news. Johnny Depp exits. Fantastic beast. It came as a surprise last Friday. I mean, not a big surprise. Um, you know, when he got when, when, when the judge didn't throw out the, the libel case and said, no, 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 he, he abused Amber Heard. He, it's okay to call him a, a wife beater legally. I think that put Warner Brothers in, in a really tricky position. Um, and I know Johnny Depp has his fans. Like they were definitely out in, in full force on social media on Friday. I also think that Johnny Depp is not nearly what he once was. Uh, and I think that Warner Brothers knows that. Like having Johnny Depp does not necessarily give you this huge box office bump the way that it used to a decade ago. Um, now they already paid him. He shot one scene already, and whether he had shot it or not, he'd signed a pay or play deal. So they already gave him his salary, which is probably around eight or ten million, maybe twelve, uh, or something like this. Um Either way, he drops out and everyone's like thinking of replacements. And the first thing I did was I hopped in our company Slack and I said, you know, does, I've never seen a Fantastic Beast movie. I've only seen like one or two of the Harry Potters. So it, it just, does somebody want to write a list like 10 actors who should replace Johnny Depp? And I said, I vote for Mads Mikkelsen or Timothy Oliphant. And a couple days later, sure enough, boom, Mads Mikkelsen cast as Grindelwald. Uh, it's a huge upgrade, I think. Not again, not that I plan to see this thing. Like, I, and you have to write about stuff that you're not going to see. It's not just you can't just write about things that interest you. Sometimes it's about you know who's on news that at that moment. Um, you know, everybody's working on different things, so you don't just write about things that you're you're passionate about or want to see. Um, Mads Mikkelsen, he, I mean, he, he's got the trifecta now. So he did Star Wars, Marvel with Doctor Strange, uh, you know, Rogue One, and now Harry Potter. Like, everybody knows Mads, even if they aren't quite sure what his name is. Um, I think he'll do a great job. To me, he just, he had that, that angular, sharp, angular face that Johnny Depp has, and he could pull off the haircut that Johnny Depp's character had. Uh, you know, there's no deal yet in place. I'm sure, you know, Mads knows he kind of has them over a barrel. They're already filming. So they're going to have to meet his quote. I wouldn't be surprised if he asked for a, a, little, a little extra. Uh, yeah, like, you know, I, I thought Oliphant would do a decent job too. Plus he's also having a moment between Fargo and, and the Mandalorian and the Tarantino movie last year. But like Matt Mads is definitely the, the way to go here. So I think it's, it's a win all around. You're losing Johnny Depp, get rid of the guy. Who cares? You're getting a really good actor in Mads. Uh, it didn't take too long. So, yeah. I, 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 I like it. Good for, for Mads. Um, and Johnny Depp, like, you know, we got a question about him last week. I think he's going to be a little bit like Mel Gibson right now. I think he is going to continue working. He's not going to be like, you know, Kevin Spacey or, or somebody like that. I don't think he'll be written off entirely. But Johnny Depp's going to have to, like, build his way back. And he's going to have to do it with good indies. And not shit, like, waiting for the Barbarians, which, again, I didn't see. Maybe it is really good. But nobody wants to see that movie. So, yeah, you're going to have to... You're going to have to find something. Well, I really wanted to see that Biggie Tupac movie, uh, Labyrinth, L.A. Brinth. Um, but that thing's been sitting on a shelf due to, like, legal stuff because of the guy who got uh, hurt working on it. So maybe that'll see the light of day and give uh, little John, Johnny Depp a little bump down the line. But uh, I think right now he probably needs to, you know, like his statement said, just step back. And, and he, he recused himself after Warner Brothers asked him to step down. He, he, didn't, he could have made it like a whole knockdown, drag out legal fight, but he didn't need another one of those. So He's like, yeah, you're already, you're going to pay me to not be in this shitty Fantastic Beast movie? Sure. It sounds like a great deal. I wish I could get a deal like that to, to get paid millions of dollars to not, a, not appear in a terrible movie. Uh, and I'm sure it will be terrible because, and again, not that I saw the Fantastic Beast movie, but I haven't heard uh, good things about either one of them. And, and if this movie doesn't work, uh, I don't even know how you make a fourth and a fifth movie. That may be why Mads, you know, was reported as an early talks rather than like there's a deal because they had to work out all the sequel stuff. 
Um, but yeah, sequels are optimistic, I would say, for that because those movies are very expensive. And in this market, I don't know that there's going to be enough box office to justify uh, their costs. Plus, J.K. Rowling, like, fuck her. Uh, speaking of fuck people, um, I don't know how much I should get into about this one, but, uh, yeah, The Rock, Dwayne Johnson, rebooting The Scorpion King, a story I've been on for months, um, didn't have the writer, it's gonna be Jonathan Herman from Straight Outta Compton, but, uh, yeah, The Rock, this role means a lot to him, it was his first big movie star role coming out of WWE, and he thinks that there's still value in the IP. Um, so he wants to pass the torch to the next generation of Scorpion King, and whether that'll be, you know, whether he'll actually be in the movie to pass that torch or not is up for debate. I wouldn't be surprised if he actually had an on screen role. Um, I didn't see the Scorpion King, I didn't really like the Mummy movies from back in that day. I, I'm not a big adventure movie guy. I think adventure is actually the trickiest genre to, to pull off. Um, so yeah, don't care about this franchise at all. Don't think that audiences care about this franchise unless they were like, I don't know, big wrestling fans back in the day. There's a whole bunch of direct-to-video sequels to The Scorpion King that you know, really tarnished the franchise. Um, so yeah, best of luck to Dwayne Johnson on rebooting this B or even C list property. And I don't even know why Universal would, would waste its time, but, uh, you know, no one wants to say no to the rock except for apparently this guy, I guess I'm the only guy in Hollywood who's willing to stand up to the rock and tell people on his team what I think of them. Uh, Seth Rogen producing a video nasty for Lionsgate. This was written by Chris Devlin centers on three teens who rent a cursed VHS and are pulled into an 80s slasher movie that threatens to trap them forever. Uh, I feel like I've seen that premise before, but, you know, in Seth Rogen's hands, maybe it's interesting. Uh, I think a lot of that will depend on the director, and there's rumors that it may be Jonathan Levine. Um, I'm all for more, like, fun... 80s slasher movie style stuff so sign me up for video nasty but at the same time let's hope it let's hope it's nasty like i what i don't want and i know it's not that i didn't like this movie because i i did like it enough i just i didn't love the ending but people flip for it and thought it was like the, the greatest thing since sliced bread i don't want another ready or not i don't want this tongue-in-cheek kind of like fucking give it to me straight you know, I don't need a, a big side of comedy with my horror. Uh, I, I think horror comedies are, are really tricky and more often than not quite overrated. Um, not bad, just overrated. And I hope that that's not what this turns into. You know, I, I don't know if this is a horror movie or more of a horror comedy, but, you know, once you get Rogan involved, of course, people are going to think laughs. Uh, Jake Gyllenhaal signing on to star in Michael Bay's Ambulance, which is described as Speed Meets Training Day. Sign me up for that premise. Uh, and that's not the only movie described as speed like that we're going to talk about. Um, apparently, Dylan O'Brien and Isaac Gonzalez are, uh, are also circling roles in this. It is described as a three hander. I think it's a remake of a Danish film about um, two brothers who steal an ambulance that's already, you know, like imagine. You've got a patient in the back. You've got a, a paramedic working on the patient. Uh, for some reason, you know, the ambulance makes a stop. The driver hops out, and then two brothers jack this ambulance, uh, and there's crazy shit going on in the back. Um, so, yeah, Jake and Dylan as brothers, totally buy that, can totally see it. Isaac Gonzalez as the paramedic, interesting. Why not? A little diversity, too. Um yeah, we'll, we'll see if those other castings work out. But listen, the idea of Jake Gyllenhaal doing a Michael Bay movie is awesome, number one. The idea of Michael Bay movie doing a Michael Bay movie, that's even better because I'm so fucking sick of the shit that Michael Bay has been pumping out. Like, just go back to your roots, bro. Bad Boys, The Rock, those, like Armageddon, those are the movies you're going to be remembered for. 
You may have all the box office records for Transformers, but no one's going to fucking think, no, no one thinks of Michael Bay as the Transformers guy. Like maybe people who are only familiar with Michael Bay through Transformers. If you've ever seen another Michael Bay movie, you think of Michael Bay as the guy from that movie, the director of Bad Boys, The Rock, Armageddon, not Transformers The Last Night. So great to see Michael Bay getting back to his roots, doing something much smaller in scale, still getting some pretty cool talent. I mean, you know, you know, you know what I think of Jake. I think, I think Jake's one of the best actors in the world right now. Um, yeah. There we go. Good, good project by Michael Bay. And Songbird looks good too. Like, I like what Michael Bay's up to. And he still has his hands in the, uh, what's it called? The quiet Place. You know what? That, I, ha I didn't have that story on the list here, and I'm glad I just brought that up. Jeff Nichols is going to be writing and directing a Quiet Place spinoff. So I don't think it's being positioned as a direct sequel to the, a Quiet Place Part 2. I don't know if it'll spin off a different character, if it's going to follow, like, Killian Murphy, or if it's going to happen follow, like... Uh, what I think that they should do is really just do a, a macro-level thing, like... Um, you know, we saw the monsters in, in invading this neighborhood or, you know, this town where Emily Blunt and John Krasinski lives with, with their family, but like pull out a little bit and, and, and you know, go, you have a, a character who's the newspaper reporter, you know, because we saw some newspaper reports in the first movie. You see, you know, the government's response, you see scientists, you see invasions all over the world or all over America, whatever it is. I think there's a lot to explore in uh, in the A Quiet Place universe. And Jeff Nichols, even though I don't want to see this movie from Jeff Nichols, like I want Jeff Nichols working on some original stuff. Like guys like him, Paul Thomas Anderson, Sean Baker, like I want to see their visions. Like It's their stories that I respond to. Um, so this is not how I want Jeff Nichols to spend his time However, would I rather him do this than say the, an, an Alien Nation movie? Yes. And do I think that he's a great get for this? Like, is he a good fit? Yes. Because he does make quieter films. He's not a bombastic filmmaker at all. Um, so yeah, I, I, I like that, that that's a good fit. Um, jumping back just to you know the speed thing, uh, Liam Neeson starring in this movie Retribution, which is a remake of a Spanish film I watched the trailer for it. It stars Luis Tosar, who was in Cell 211. Track down that Spanish movie. That was going to be remade uh, and never came to fruition. I think Paul Haggis was working on that for a while for CBS Films. Always liked Cell 211 about a guy who's like, you know, going to be starting the next day as like a prison guard. And so he's getting a tour of the prison and there's like a riot or something. And he's like trapped in there with, with the prisoners, but they don't know, you know, who, who he is. Uh, Seth, I wish Cell to Eleven would would, would uh, make a comeback, uh, an English language re remake of that. Anyways, instead we're getting Retribution. It is about a guy. It's basically like Speed, but in a car instead of a bus, and the passengers are now the guy's family. So Liam Neeson's going to be in there with like two kids, even though he's sixty five or something at this point. Uh, two young kids and there's gonna be you know a bomb in the car and, and the mad bombers calling him and, and telling giving him certain commands and stuff like that. Uh, the trailer for, for the original looked really cool. Uh, again, looking forward to seeing who directs this because I don't think it had a director. but uh, you know this, this is what you want to see from Liam Neeson as long as he can still do it. And I guess you could really have, have anybody in this kind of role um since it's, the guy's probably just going to be sitting in the car talking on the phone most of the time hey call tom hardy from lock but Lee, you know i like this one for liam neeson we got a lot of these you know action movie type announcements this week we also found out gerard butler is coming back for night has fallen this is the fourth film in the has fallen franchise and they're bringing back uh, rick roman Waugh to direct he did the last one um, I like this franchise. It, it is a guilty pleasure franchise. I'm not here to defend it as one of the greats. I even, you know, I, I don't know. Like, the, the, I don't want to call Mike Banning an iconic role for Gerard Butler, but it kind of is. Like, he's done four of these movies now. I just, I think it's so funny that back in the day, you know, White House Downs sold. It was this huge spec. It sold for like $3 million, right? 
And then, uh, you know, Olympus has fallen, beat it to theaters, just totally undercut it, stole its momentum, and it turned out to be a better movie. You know, who knew that Gerard Butler and Aaron Eckhart, which is sort of the B-movie casting for something like that, compared at the time to Channing Tatum and Jamie Foxx, who knew that, that not only would that movie be better, but it would spawn this successful franchise in that the franchise would recover after the terrible sequel, London Has Fallen. Angel Has Fallen was a pretty solid entry. So not sure what, what the plot is for Night Has Fallen, whether Gerard Butler is going to be taken on vampires or some shit like that. But I, I, like, I like the title. It's, it's clever. Millie Bobby Brown starring in a Netflix movie, Damsel from uh, Juan Carlos Fresnadillo. It's crazy, I, you know, I really thought Fresnadillo had the same standing in the industry like that he has had in my head for the last decade, but he hasn't made a movie since 2011, since Intruders, which was like this little horrible Clive Owen piece of shit. Uh, maybe not horrible, but not, not good. Uh, can't believe he hasn't made a movie in close to a decade. That's wild because he had a lot of heat on him after uh, 28 weeks later, which was a, you know, a decent sequel. Not, not quite on the level as of uh, Danny Boyle's original. Damsel, um, this is like the fourth or fifth Netflix movie that, that uh, Millie Bobby Brown's doing. Like the streamer, like, and she's lined up other studio gigs. She's obviously got those Godzilla movies, but uh, Netflix has really made it a priority to hang on to her and, and to keep her just to stay in business with her. Like, you know, she's the star of its biggest show, Stranger Things. Uh, they tried to keep the plot details under wraps, but unfortunately they were dealing with the insider. So uh, had to had to let the cat out of the bag and say, this is a movie about a young princess who gets married off to this, you know, other kingdom. And she's like so excited about going there and meeting Prince Henry. And then it turns out, well, in this kingdom, we actually sacrifice our princesses to a dragon. And so she is going to, it's called Damsel, you know, we think Damsel in Distress, like she's going to be waiting for, you know, the prince to come save her. There's no prince coming to save her in this. She is going to have to battle this dragon on her own. Um, and yeah, that sounds cool. Like if I was a 13, 14 year old kid, boy, girl, whatever, I want to see Millie Bobby Brown battle some dragons. That, that works. So nice job by Netflix on this one. Uh, Fresno Dio is an interesting choice to direct. Um, I've heard the budget's going to be around 60 or 70 million. So they're going to be spending some money on this. This isn't like, you know, a, a gigantic four quadrant movie for them, but, uh, you know, it, it, it is aimed at, at the teens, at the future buyers of tomorrow who are going to be, you know, going off to college in a few years and getting their own Netflix accounts or whatever. Um, so yeah, smart move to, to stay in business with MBB. Uh, and, and, you know, they still haven't announced a sequel for Enola Holmes, so that you can almost guarantee when it's coming. I think that movie did fairly well. And, and again, I, I didn't see it, so I don't know what happens with Henry Cavill or whatever, but uh, whether they bring him back or not, whether they need him or not, like, she's really all you need right now to, to get eyeballs on that kind of movie on Netflix. So I, I anticipate some kind of sequel announcement uh, soon enough. There were, oh, Miles and Shailene, Miles Teller, Shailene Woodley getting back together. This is like, I wish I had the number in front of me. I think it's like their, it could either be their third, fourth, or even fifth movie together. Um, I know they were supposed to do a drift and it didn't work out. I think they're going to be playing a, a liberal, a young liberal couple who move in next door and, and realize that their new neighbor uh, is like this, you know, military veteran, very conservative. And he goes about building like a nine foot tall fence you know, to, to keep out terrorists. And, and I'm sure, you know, it, it's just not friendly. It's not uh, inviting. It probably is an eyesore in the neighborhood and drives down property values. And uh, it's going to be, a, yeah, about this, you know, liberal couple clashing with this conservative neighbor played by William Hurt, which is really good casting. Um, I think this could be really interesting. And it's an Icelandic director. I forget what he did. I don't have the article in front of me. But I always like seeing Miles and Shailene together. If you haven't seen The Spectacular now, please track that one down because that is terrific. Uh, Some TV stuff. Uh, Peacemaker, the John Cena series, right? That uh, added Daniel Brooks from Orange is the New Black and Robert Patrick. 
I'd love to see Robert Patrick become like the new Michael Rooker. That would be cool. Uh, and that also makes me think Michael Rooker is going to die in, in the Suicide Squad. The After Party, the Lord and Miller Apple series, that got a cool cast, including Tiffany Haddish and, and Dave Franco and John Early. And it's like a bit of a, a murder mystery. So there's some search party vibes there for my fellow John Early fans. Uh, WandaVision coming in 2021, January. Finally got a release month for that thing. So hopefully 2021 is just a much better year than 2020. And Marvel is going to kick it off with WandaVision, which I've heard really good things about that series. Um, HBL also announced that it's two-part Tiger Woods documentary. Tiger is going to be debuting in January. So we've already got some things to look forward to in the new year. Uh, Maria Bakalova signed with CAA this week. A big get for CAA. Very nice sign for them. Let's hope that they can uh, do something for her career because she really was quite brilliant in, in Borat too. Um, I think that was certainly the performance everybody kind of came away talking about because we've seen Borat before. We've seen Sasha Baron Cohen shtick, but that this uh, young Bulgarian actress just embraced it so hard, so wholeheartedly and left it all out there on the screen and wasn't afraid to just, you know, do crazy shit and embarrass herself. Um, she, she could have a really nice career, you know? So, we'll, but it's all about how, how CA navigates that in the in the next few years. Uh, we'll see if she gets an Oscar nomination. I mean, I, I've mentioned Melissa McCarthy in Bridesmaids. You know, I, I don't know that this is quite on that level, but it's got to be close. Um, I mean, this was almost, I got like Cameron Diaz and something about Mary vibes from this. Uh, so... Yeah, we'll, we'll see. I mean, I, again, I know she's Bulgarian. She probably has an, an accent. Um, she is classically trained and all that. But, uh, you know, I, I think we're going to be seeing some interesting things from her. And, and maybe, you know, maybe whatever Sasha Baron Cohen works on next, maybe she'll, he'll, uh, he'll set aside a role for her. Um, you know, we're seeing a lot of these kinds of stories where it's like, it's, it's a good, it's an important story to tell. I understand it. It's good for diversity and that kind of stuff. But I also just like, well, who's, who's really going to be watching this stuff, you know? So we got like Denai Guerrero doing a, a Shirley Chisholm. I think it's a movie. Uh, Selena Gomez is playing a, a trailblazing gay Peruvian mount, mountaineer. And it's like, you know, those are, both good things for those actresses. Um, but I, I just, they seem like such niche projects, not because they're about black women or Peruvian gay women. I'm just like, I, I don't know if as an executive, I would make those same calls. Like does Selena Gomez's audience want to see her as a trailblazing gay mountaineer? Like, I don't know. I suspect not. Uh, I mean, I, yeah. But then again, it's like, I, I thought people would see Wild with Reese Witherspoon and nobody even goes to see those kinds of movies with like a big A-list star. So uh, again, while I understand putting these projects into development, it's going to be, I'm going to be very, very curious to see whether, you know, these financiers and networks and studios and whatnot, whether they actually pull the trigger on some of these development projects that everybody's cheering on, but like, is there really an audience to justify the cost of these things? And then, and, and by the way, that is how, th this is what you get from the Snyder Cut that like, you're not gonna find anywhere else. People talk about development without any regard for the business side of it. For, for you know, is this going to make money? Does this make financial decision uh, make financial sense to make this decision. Um, so, you know, they, they can divorce themselves from the business side of it. And they can just say creatively, like, of course we want stories about Shirley Chisholm. Of course we want stories about trailblazing gay mountaineers, you know? Um, and, and I get that. And I, and I support that, but as an executive, do I want to put my money where my mouth is? I don't know that I would in those two cases. And, uh, yeah, I feel like a lot of film critics and bloggers, they don't have to put their money where their mouth is. And, and if they did, 
their mouths would not be where, you know, they normally are. Um, Ruth Wilson and Andrew Scott doing an HBO movie, Oslo, based on the, the Tony Award winning play. Uh, it's got a big EP team behind it, Steven Spielberg. It sounds mildly interesting, I guess. Uh, you know, it's all about the peace accords in Oslo and, and Israelis and Palestinians working behind the scenes to, to make it happen. So, you know, it could be interesting. It's about people coming together and, and doing some healing. I think we could all use that from right, right now. MRC film, the leading independent studio. <laughs> Jesus. Uh, has set... Linda Wolverton to adapt uh, Eloise. Remember the Eloise books, Eloise in Paris? Well, they've been, they've been uh, usurped by Emily in Paris. So now, now it's not Eloise in Paris, it's just strictly Eloise. Hollywood's been trying to do right by these books forever, blah, 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 good luck. L Linda Wolverton's a really good screenwriter, don't get me wrong, but uh, you know this is, this is a series for little girls. Maybe I'll take my niece. Um, but yeah, MRC, you know. They own Todd Reporter or, you know, it's the same company. Now Penske, PMC by Todd Reporter and it's a joint venture with MRC and Valens and blah, blah, blah. And that's how you get MRC leading independence. Um, CinemaCon got bumped from spring to late summer. I'm thankful because I'm certainly in no rush to, to go hang out in Las Vegas. Uh, yet at the same time, I mean, like this is not a good sign, guys. If theater owners themselves are afraid about being in Caesar's Palace in Las Vegas, which again, huge auditorium and holds five thousand people, that's a different, you know, that that's like going to a sporting event rather than just going to a movie theater. Um, if the theater owners themselves do not feel comfortable attending a conference in April, what makes you think that there's going to be a summer movie season next year? You know, like, I, I just don't think that that announcement bode well for that at all. Like, you have to read between the lines of these things a little bit. If they're putting off CinemaCon, which is supposed to be in late April, how do they, how do they expect us to feel confident about returning to cinemas in April? I, I don't understand it. Um, yeah, the movie business, theatrically at least, is is screwed for for a while. I, I hope there's a summer movie season. God knows I, I missed it this year, but uh, again, financially, it just doesn't doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to put these movies out and just cross your fingers and, and hope that that people show up. Um, None of my friends are, are eager to like return. Like things are still spiking. The, the numbers are getting worse than ever. We talked about that last week. So I just don't see the situation improving until there is a vaccine. I don't think that there will be a vac vaccine that even starts to go out until mid 2021. It's going to take months to, to vaccinate people. I, I don't think that the first thing you, you're going to do after you get vaccinated is rush to a movie theater. So it's not good. Meanwhile, you know, uh, the Academy is still holding the Oscars, even though movies are just dropping out left and right. Uh, Warner Brothers ha has not moved Wonder Woman 1984 yet, but it will. Um, and yet, so it's like, how could the Academy go forward with this ridiculous idea like, where it's going to be a struggle to fill out the, be the best picture category from what I've seen this year? Not the best documentary category because most of the, the movies, great movies I've seen this year have been docs. But, uh, you know, when MTV is acknowledging there's not going to be an MTV Movie Awards this year, uh, we're just doing a, a, a greatest of all time, which, by the way, is not greatest of all time. It only goes back to the 80s, which is all time to me as well, practically. Uh, MTV launched in 81. So I think they're going to be honoring, you know, oh, the greatest movies of the last 40 years or so. Um, Vanessa Hudgens is hosting. Aren't you guys excited? Vanessa Hudgens is hosting the MTV Movie and uh, TV Awards. Why? Why Vanessa Hudgens? Beats me. Like, who makes these fucking decisions? Oh my God, I would love to be an executive just to be in the room to, to, to hear the, the discussions where, where this shit comes up. 
Vanessa Hudgens. Like, who fucking cares? Holy shit. Um, yeah. The MTV Movie Awards has been going downhill for a long time. Google my name and MTV Movie Awards and you'll find out what it's all about. They started out honoring awesome movies, R-rated movies, and then it just became like the Twilight Awards and the show's never recovered since then. Um, the Weeknd is going to be doing the Super Bowl halftime show. I like The Weeknd. I dig The Weeknd, bro. I'm down for that halftime show, even though I know the Patriots won't be playing in the game this year because they're horrible. Uh, Netflix picked up a spy series starring Arnold Schwarzenegger. What? You know, whatever. That, that used to mean something. Uh, I don't think that Arnold's involvement in, in things means quite as much as it did back then. They also picked up International on News of the World, which is interesting. You know, that is still on the calendar, I believe, that Universal wants to release that, um, you know, in December for awards consideration. But, uh, you know, maybe that ends up going PBOD as well, the way that, you know, Focus has been releasing Kajillionaire um, on, on PBOD. Although Let Him Go, I think, was is just a theater. So I don't know, man. I, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see what happens with News of the World. Um, that, that has to have cost a pretty penny, too, because of the period and, and Hanks and Greengrass. Like, that has to be like a $60 million movie or something like that. It was, I just thought it was interesting that Netflix picked up international and did not pick up domestic. So, so maybe it means that they're either hammering out a deal with another streamer or it's just not going to streaming and they're going to stick with it. Uh, also, Netflix adding cast to Narcos season three. Luis Gerardo Mendez, who stars in Focus's Half Brothers from Luke Greenfield, he has joined the cast along with Puerto Rican singer Bad Bunny and Bo Murchoff, my old Schmodown teammate for a day. We lost that match to, to Johnny Roca. It's the only thing Johnny Roga has ever beaten me at. Uh, so I, I have held a grudge against Bo Murchoff, but when I saw that he was part of this uh, announcement, I was thrilled for him because I think Narcos is great. It's one of the best shows on Netflix. Um, so yeah, good. Congrats to, to him and, and everybody else who joined the cast. Uh, Gotham nominations came out today. Who cares? Never cared about the Gothams. They're completely irrelevant. It's just a bunch of highfalutin critics saluting first cow this year. It just what if we had people like me? What if what if there were people like me on the Gotham Awards committee? Who knows what kind of movies and performances would be nominated? Who knows what kind of crap would be ignored? First cow. <laughs> I don't know what to say about this shit, man. That's it. I don't even need to see First Cow. I know exactly what it is because it's directed by Kelly Reichert. Um, and I know. Yeah, never mind. Jeopardy replacements. Uh, God, what a what a depressing list. First of all, not seeing enough women uh, being put into the conversation for this. Would love to see a female Jeopardy host. Ken Jennings is is the odds on favorite. This guy is boring. This guy is like watching fucking paint dry. He's you know made for a fun contestant. You had a nice streak, Ken Jennings. You're not a fucking game show host. So I don't care how close he was with Alex Trebek. Alex Trebek's not making the, the replacement de decision from beyond the grave. As a TV executive, again, something I should be, if you own a TV station or a network, hire me because I will make better decisions than the people working for you. Ken Jennings should not be hosting Jeopardy. George Stephanopoulos should not be hosting Jeopardy. LeVar Burton, maybe, probably the best name I've heard. Neil deGrasse Tyson would have been good if he wasn't such like a slimeball weirdo creep who, who seems to put his foot in his mouth every other month. Uh, Pat Sajak, no, you're the Wheel of Fortune guy. You don't need to become the Jeopardy guy now. Um, Donald Trump, that was a funny one. I saw <laughs> Trump wants to host uh, Jeopardy. No. Um, Jesus, that would be fun just to watch it for a week. Here's the thing about Jeopardy. You can't, it's a cultural institution. You can't just have some flavor of the month celebrity come and do it for a few seasons. You want someone who wants to host this show for the next 20 years. So no, you don't want Joe Rogan uh, and you don't want, you know, these celebrities like Jane Lynch, who I think actually would make a decent Jeopardy show host, but then she becomes 
the Jeopardy host and not Jane Lynch, the actress who can do very, you know, various things. Um, you need someone, I think, smart, someone who clearly projects intelligence, someone with patience, someone who's good with, you know, uh, the occasional zinger, maybe it, uh, has a dry sense of humor. Um, I'd have to, I'd have to think on, on who should actually be hosting Jeopardy, but I, I haven't liked any of the names that I've heard. LeVar Burton has been the best one. Please don't let it be Ken Jennings. Josh McCuga, I'm all for it. Let's we'll, we'll give it to McCoogs. Jamie Foxx starring in The Burial from Maggie Betts. I, I wouldn't have called that. I wouldn't have seen this pairing coming at all. She's the director of Novitiate. Based on a true story, it's about a bankrupt funeral home director or a funeral home owner who decides to sue a rival businessman over a handshake deal gone wrong, uh, prompting him to hire a flamboyant attorney to handle the case. Uh, not sure if Fox is going to be playing the attorney or the bankrupt funeral home owner or the rival businessman, but uh, I, I think Jamie Fox is a really good actor and, you know, Project Power, Sleepless, like it's been a little while since we've really seen him uh, dive in. I mean, well, actually, forgive me, Just Mercy. He was, he was very, very good in that. Very, very good. Um, so, yeah, Jamie Fox working with Maggie Betts. Sounds interesting. Decent enough logline. Oprah and uh, bad, bleh, Oprah Winfrey and Brad Pitt teaming uh, with Tamisi Coates um, for The Water Dancer, right? An MGM set in the pre-Civil War South. It follows Hiram Walker, born into bondage, who possesses a photographic memory but has no memory of his mother. A car accident reveals to him a superpower called conduction which is an ability to travel large distances triggered by powerful memories of his mother. So when he thinks about his mother, he, he has this ability to, to superconduct. Uh, as he struggles to gain an understanding of this power, he becomes involved with the Underground Railroad and meets historical figures. Sounds like it could be pretty interesting. I've never read the book, um, but Oprah and Brad Pitt, that, that's as big a producing team as you're going to find. MGM has just a very, very full development slate. And I do wonder how they're paying for all this stuff. Like, you know, they're having financial difficulties right now. You know, according to reports, uh, I'm kind of amazed that they keep getting their hands on these high profile packages and whatnot. Um, and, oh, and the MGM guy, by the way, kudos to Variety for actually delving into this lawsuit that, you know, it may have been, I don't know if it was thrown out or just like buried because there was some kind of a settlement. But Variety reported that uh, the, the guy, the, the, the venture capitalist who sort of owns MGM or, you know, is, is in charge of it, Keith Ulick, had been, uh, you know, accused of sexual assault or whatever in, in a hotel room, I believe. So, man, MGM just having a very tough go of it lately, obviously, with all the bond stuff. Um, these these allegations don't make things any better for the studio. And uh, something is going to have to give on that front soon. Um. Yeah, this is it's, it's kind of interesting watching Mank, you know, given all the MGM history. By the way, because I'm like, this studio has always been on the ropes. It has always sort of it's had a real roller coaster ride through Hollywood, and it is such a memorable brand that it hasn't just faded away entirely. You know, Leo the Lion. You know, he, he's the star. A lot of people have uh, have forgotten that, and they tw those stars twinkle elsewhere. I mean, you know, that was a good line in, in Mank, but um, yeah, MGM, rooting, rooting for them. But uh, again, like, what, what is this? The water, the water, it's another thing that's like we're committed to diversity and inclusion and representation. But at the end of the day, are people going to show up for this movie? You know, that, that's the thing. Like when, when you release Moonlight, who, who is the audience? Is that mainly, you know, art house loving white people or is it the black people that you're ostensibly making the, the, the movie for? I mean, not that movies are made for black or white people, but yeah, it just seems like a very expensive property and I don't know what the returns on something like the water dancer would be. Although I'm interested in a, in a kind of historical slavery drama meets superpowers. Not necessarily superhero, but uh, you know, uh, we'll, we'll we'll see. I guess um, some release date stuff. Jordan Peele announced a new horror movie that's going to come out in July 2022. 
Uh, nobody knows what this is. We don't have a title, a log line, nothing. All we know is that it's horror. It's probably not the people under the stairs because he's, uh, I'd heard he was just going to be producing that one. Um, but it is, you know, th this is real. He got a California tax credit to shoot this thing. And just the fact that Universal is, is staking out a, a date in the middle of, uh, you know, summer 22, which may be the first summer back for, uh, you know, just Jordan Peele movie, whose, whose movies have just printed, been printing money for them. I think that the combined cost of Get Out and Us was something like 25 million and they've made like 510 million or something worldwide. Um, Minari set a limited run for New York and LA on December 11th before expanding on uh, February 12th. The Oscar nominations are the following month on the 15th. Neon announced it's releasing uh, Ammonite theatrically on November 13th in the US. So that's, it's like, they're just throwing these movies out there. Here's the contractual theatrical release. And then it's going PVOD on December 4th. That is how most people will watch it. This is one, it's like, I, I feel like I should watch it, right? It's Kate Winslet, it's Saoirse Ronan, it was supposed to be an awards contender. But like, I haven't heard good things about it. And it just looks like I've seen it before, done better last year in Portrait of a Lady on Fire. So uh, again, this seems just like Neon cutting its losses and acknowledging this is probably not going to be a big awards contender, but we got to try to salvage some, some money on this by releasing it on PVOD. Um, was there any other? Oh, one second. Let me just go down the list. Solstice Studios today announced a new cut of the Mark Wahlberg movie, uh, Good Joe Bell, which is now Joe Bell. I, I guess he's not good anymore. He wasn't good enough to have good in the title. Maybe good made it sound like Good Will Hunting. Uh, so now it's just Joe Bell, which is a not a great title. Um, Solstice bought it for $20 million. Seems risky to me. Uh, and it's about a guy who like walked across the country after his gay son got bullied and yada, yada, yada. I don't want to say more than that um, since it's apparently presented as some kind of a reveal in the movie. Um, I heard decent things about it. I heard it's like an emotionally affecting story. It sounds like Mark Gill's uh, acquisitions team agreed with him on that. Um, you know, the director's promising. Ronaldo Marcus Green, I think uh, he's doing um, King Richard the Will Smith, uh, William Sisters movie. Uh, and I've heard Mark Wahlberg is, is good in this, but uh, anyways, it's coming out February 19th. So that's like basically a qualifying run because there's nine days left in February. So th they do want to try to get some awards attention on it, but I just don't know if that's going to fly this year. You know, it's one thing to release it around Christmas, you know, when there's six days left in the year and, you know, there's all kinds of buzz around it and, and people have time to watch it because it's Christmas. February 19th, I just don't think it has the same thing. I, it seems like, it still feels like a dumping ground, even though I know it is the new the new Christmas, technically. Um, do, 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 do. We did that, we did that. I'm close. We're close to wrapping this thing up, guys. Uh, right. A lot of like theater talk. Okay. So AMC is, is hyping. It's, you know, 99 bucks to rent a theater, maybe 149. If you, if you want to watch an actual new release with it, you can invite up to 20 people. Meanwhile, AMC has had a 90% drop in revenue and a, and they post a $900 million quarterly loss. They lost almost a billion dollars the last quarter. Meanwhile, you've got people touting this vaccine you know pfizer says it's 90 percent effective or something and, and there was speculation that that life could return to normal by march or april i mean lol to that stuff like it's just not gonna fucking happen regal okay closed it's eight the 18 locations it had left open in new york and california and all theaters have been shut down in sacramento and san diego because of all the surging I mean, that's the first thing to go. These governors are just like, why would we have movie theaters open right now? It makes no sense. It's not worth it for anyone to risk their own health by going to a movie theater and risk everyone else's health health they interact with after seeing that movie. You've got the IMAX CEO, Richard Gelfin, saying Pfizer said it's a it said it has a game. Sorry, Pfizer said it's a game changer in terms of public health issues. This is with regards to the vaccine. And I think the vaccine is a game changer in terms of the movie industry. No one had a time frame before. The announcement puts bookends on it. Guys, 
all these quotes that you're seeing from these theatrical uh, you know, executives, they're all designed to make you feel safer about coming back to the movies. That is their job. It's their job to sell. It's, no one is like using common sense. No one is saying, you know what? It's, it, it, I wouldn't go back to theaters, but it is safe. Like no one has gotten sick in theaters. No one has gotten sick in th movie theaters, right? Because no one's going to movie theaters, okay? Variety. While IMAX is Gelfin speculated that a vaccine could be widely available by April, there are reasons to doubt that optimistic timetable. Yes. See, a journalist, people, you know, who don't have money riding on this thing, they will tell you the truth. That's our job. We're, we are truth tellers. I'm not saying that the trades are always truth tellers. Um, the trades exist. That is literally their function is to carry water for those in the industry. Variety also says there are other hurdles for the exhibition industry related to the timing of vaccine. Some studios, such as Warner Brothers, which had planned, again, this is past tense, which had planned to, to debut Wonder Woman 1984 in December, may now be included to hold off on distributing the movie until a vaccine is in circulation. The logic is simple. So Variety, without reporting that Wonder Woman 1984 has been pulled, is basically saying, use your fucking head it's inevitable Wonder Woman 1984 is not coming out in three fucking weeks. Like, you're crazy. Um, blah, 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 blah. We talked about MTV. Uh, okay. Real quickly. Reviews. Uh, Fat Man. I watched Fat Man. I, same thing with Hillbillyology. Anyone who's like a bad person, they get bad reviews. Uh, so if Hillbillyology, you know talks, um, invokes some of the same stuff that Trump likes to talk, to talk about or whatever. It's a bad movie, according to film critics. It's that man. It has Mel Gibson. It's a bad movie. It's not a bad movie. It's just not nearly as fun as it should be. I do agree with the reviews. This one was a mild disappointment. Uh, the, the, the Nelms, but like, first of all, I don't understand like the, the, the plot that I guess it's more of like a B plot, but like Santa's involvement with the U.S. government and, and their deal and their arrangement and why the two need each other. None of that shit worked. It was boring and there was too much time spent on it. This is about a kid who gets a piece of coal for Christmas. He's a little brat shit with access to money. So he hires a hitman who comes after Santa. And, and it just should have been like a balls to the wall, more exploitative B movie, like B midnight movie. And instead, yeah. I saw, I saw a few reviews that basically said this, like the Nelms brothers think that this is a lot funnier and more exciting than it really is. Um, there's some decent cinematography in it. And, and I thought, you know, Mel Gibson was, was fine. Um, you know, Marianne Jean, Jean Baptiste as, as his wife was, was fine. Like everybody's fine. Uh, I, I like Walton Goggins a lot, but it just didn't, it wasn't crazy enough. I mean, if you're going to make this movie, like go fucking balls to the wall on it. And it just didn't have like the courage of its convictions. Echo Boomers, I thought was a decent debut, uh, directorial debut. I, th I think the guy's name is Seth Savoy. Forgive me if I, if I botched that, because this is all just off memory. Um, movie was okay. It was actually decent, but it is dragged down by its leading man, Patrick Schwarzenegger, who just isn't a leading man. Like he, he's bland. He is a, He's just a, he's just stiff. And, and I know he's playing the straight man here, but uh, it just didn't, didn't work for me. Um, the movie is worth a watch though on VOD. You know, if you got five ninety nine to spare, whatever the hell they're going to put it out for, it, you know, it, it had energy. I actually really liked the supporting performances. Um, almost the entire gang, including Alex Pettifer, but Alex Pettifer and his whole gang, that was, they were pretty well cast. Uh, I, I like the female lead a lot. I like the other, the blonde kid who, who's not Patrick Schwarzenegger or Alex Pettifer. Uh, it was good to see Oliver Cooper and something like this. Michael Shannon is still the reason to see it. Michael Shannon is, is always good. He's good here. Uh, I also saw Sleepless Beauty, which is a movie like about a, a girl who gets kidnapped and thrown in this room and said, you know, they're, they're, the only rule is you can't sleep. And that is a great premise. Like, oh my God, like... The things when the when the mind can't sleep, like you can put suggestions in there. You can use her to create some kind of weapon. Um, 
there's some crazy animation in this movie, but ultimately this movie was a total bust. Uh, this is not worth your VOD time uh, or, or money. Um, first of all, you, like it's so much scarier when you're watching a foreign language movie and it's in a foreign language and, and it's subtitled. I watched the dubbed version of this. I hate dubbed. It doesn't work. I know there's not like that many close-ups of her talking, so you can't really tell how dubbed it is. Uh, like the first 10, 10, 15 minutes, I wasn't even sure. I had to actually write to the publicist and be like, is this, is there a subtitle version or is this dubbed? Like what is going on here? Um, I just, again, I thought it was a really great premise that they just did not execute well uh, and just didn't do enough with. Um, and, it, and it starts strong and just gets progressively worse. And, and it's not nearly like gory enough. Like you're going to fucking make this movie appeal to the gore hounds and shit like that. Uh, trailers this week, really quickly. Assassins, best movie I saw at Sundance. Track down this trailer. It's about the two uh, women who, I'm not even going to say accused. They did it. They, they killed Kim Jong-un's brother. In, an, in a Thai airport, I believe it was, by smearing DX chemical on, on his face. They thought it was like part of a, a prank show. Truly, the trailer says it. It's like one of the craziest murders slash crimes of the 21st century. And speaking of famous crimes, the mystery of D.B. Cooper, that we're getting a documentary on that on HBO. D.B. Cooper is the guy who hijacked a plane, uh, you know, got millions of dollars, got some parachutes, jumped out of the plane and was never caught, never seen again. A lot of people have claimed to be D.B. Cooper over the years, to know D.B. Cooper over the years. Uh, I'm kind of I know that they, this story has been explored a lot in media, but I feel like a lot of it predates me. Uh, so I'm actually really excited to, to dive into that HBO doc. Uh, HBO Max dropped a, a proper trailer for Super Intelligence which just looks like another bad Melissa McCarthy, Ben Falcon movie. I'll probably watch it because I do find her watchable and, and, you know, occasionally entertaining. I like the supporting cast here, Bobby Cannavale and uh, Brian Tyree Henry, James Corden, but this looks like another stinker. Uh, small acts. I need to watch those Steve McQueen movies. I'll probably save those for, for next month when, when things start to slow down. Uh, we got a trailer for the Kristen Stewart movie, Happiest Season. Uh, I thought it looked cute. Her, Mackenzie Davis, Dan Levy. Um, yeah, a, a nice gay-themed holiday rom-com. Uh, it seems maybe a little dated, like this would have really been good 10, 15 years ago. Um, it reminded me a little of like In and Out with Kevin Klein. But uh, but yeah, there's a le- it's not just, it's not gay. It's lesbian this time. And, uh, and I like these two together, Kristen Stewart and, and Mackenzie Davis, and they, they have a fun cast around them. So we'll see if that, uh, makes a waves on Hulu. Netflix dropped a trailer for Mosul, the foreign language movie from produced by the, the Russo brothers from Matthew Michael Carnahan. I thought it looked awesome. Totally pumped for this on Thanksgiving. Sign me up. It comes out, I believe on Thanksgiving, the Hardy boys, Again, why, why are we doing this? The Hardy Boys, Nancy Drew. Do kids still read this stuff? I read this stuff, but like now there's just so much more shit. Like are kids still going back to those old, old franchises? The Hardy Boys, I, I barely even recognized it. Um, yeah, I, I don't know what that is or who it's for. It, it looks bad. Uh uh, not as that is a wild mountain time though. Holy shit. John Patrick Shanley, the director of doubt, which is amazing. Um, he did this movie with Emily Blunt and Jamie Dornan, John Hamm and Christopher Walken. It's set in Ireland. You look at the poster. It has the same font that every fucking Woody Allen poster uses. And apparently it, it's trying to do the same thing as Woody Allen. There's like some magical realism involved or there's like a curse some shit romance between Emily Blunt and Jamie Dornan. This movie looked wretched, like fucking wretched. Uh, like people were like, did, did we see the same trailer? Uh, we did. Uh, you're just an idiot. That movie, it, you got Jamie Dornan doing Pratt Falls in the middle of the Irish countryside. I don't know what the tone of this movie is. No, Jamie Corn- Dornan is not who I think of when I want comedy or even a romantic comedy, certainly not one set in Ireland. Like, what are people thinking? 
Best of luck to Bleecker Street on that one. Uh, and then lastly, mailbag questions from the Geeky Gator. He asked if I had watched Lovecraft Country or Raised by Wolves. I, I did start both of them. I watched Lovecraft Country for one episode, wasn't into it. And, you know, judging by the, the debate in the Collider office, that didn't sound like the show went anywhere interesting. Um, really don't care about that anymore. It was, it was so funny because I lobbied HBO for, the, for the, the screeners. I saw the first one. I was like, all right, I got to see two, three, four, five. And then, you know, I started hearing things about those episodes. And I was like, you know what? I'm all set on that show. Raised by Wolves, I watched the first three. I thought they were interesting. But again, not compelling enough to make me finish. I, that show has just sat there you know, in the, in the pile. And there's, there's just too much content. If you don't love a show, why, why are you watching it? it? It's one thing when it's a movie and it's like, all right, I, I got to finish this thing. You know, it's two hours. I, 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 but am I going to spend another seven fucking hours watching Raised by Wolves or, or five more hours if I'm not like super into it? No. Um, and then when is Collider FYC returning? We'll end the show there. The uh, F Collider FYC is returning. I don't know if it'll be, you know, regular programming, but we are going to be doing a special in the next few weeks, hopefully, maybe a month, tied to Mank coming out on Netflix on December 4th. Because, uh, yeah, I, oh, I can't wait for that episode. Because you just know Scott Mance has loved it. You just know it. I can't wait to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Mance debating the merits of this uh, Mank movie and its awards uh, possibilities or whatever. Anyways, the show ran long. I got to go. The Snyder Cut, at the end Snyder, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Cameo, blah, 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 blah. Uh, for our audio listeners, you know, we're between providers right now. Our contract with Podcast One ended. Um, Adam Goldberg, sorry, Adam Goldberg. Matt Goldberg and Adam Chitwood wrote something on the site uh, explaining why the Collider podcast has stopped updating your feeds. I've gotten some inquiries as well as to why the Snyder Cut isn't updating in feeds. Just come to YouTube. Just Get it here. You can see my facial expressions in person. You don't have to watch. Just put it on. Listen to the audio. Whatever. It's the same thing. Uh, okay, that's it. Mank, out. <laughs>